Hello, everybody, and welcome to the From Poverty to Progress channel, the channel that is devoted to promoting an awareness and understanding of human progress. My name is Michael Magoon, and I'm the author of the From Poverty to Progress book series. The first book in my book series is entitled From Poverty to Progress, and it explains the origin and causes of modern progress. My second book, which I'm excited to announce is now available on pre-release, is about applying those lessons so how we can keep progress going, both in the United States, Western Europe, and in developing nations. Today, I'm going to start a new series, which I call Myth-Busting Progress. I'm going to look at a number of theories about the causes of human material progress and try and figure out, are they true? Are they just myths? And what can we learn from each one of these theories? As a reminder, my definition of progress is the sustained improvement in the material standard of living of a large group of people over a long period of time. If you want to know more about my theories on the causes of progress, see the list of videos at the bottom. The first theory that I'm going to take a look at is, did the Enlightenment cause progress? Now, for those of you who've been following my channel, you know that I recently did a book review on Steven Pinker's book, Enlightenment Now, The Case for Reason, Science, Humanism, and Progress. And in it, he states a theory for the causes of progress. And in a nutshell, he believes that the Enlightenment created the ideals that made modern progress possible. Overall, I love the book, but I also also mentioned that I had differences of opinion on the actual causes of progress. So in this video, I'm going to go into more detail. And it's important to recognize that, that Steven Pinker did not invent this theory. This goes back way back. In fact, it's very much a part of what one might call the Western civilizational view of progress, where progress comes from great thinkers, philosophers, economists. The theory basically states that modern progress is caused by the application of reason over tradition, science over religion and superstition, uses the ideals of humanism, which is a secular foundation for morality, and believes in individual rights and constitutional government. And it was really in the Enlightenment that these ideas first rose into prominence and popularity. The philosophers of the Enlightenment challenged the dogmas of Christianity, the divine right of kings, and in general, criticized the medieval worldview, which was based primarily on the Bible and Aristotelian philosophy. So before I go on to look at the, uh, whether or not it was a cause of progress, I'm going to overview a little bit about what the Enlightenment is. The Enlightenment was an intellectual movement centered primarily in Northwest Europe, and it's roughly between the periods of 1715 and 1800. Now, anytime you read a book about the Enlightenment, you'll get various definitions of exactly when and exactly where. Some started earlier. Um, and they include, for example, the Scientific Revolution or even the Renaissance, which were earlier intellectual movements in that area. Others will go a little bit into the 19th century, but I think that's a good place to start. And it was primarily centered in France, particularly Paris, the capital of France, in Scotland, particularly Edinburgh, and in England, particularly London. It was also important in the Netherlands and in what later became Germany. In the Enlightenment, the philosophers came up with radical new ideas concerning God, religion, tradition, reason, science, the relationship between the people and the government, natural rights, and how to use knowledge to create a better world. Some people use the term the Republic of Letters, which is essentially a network of intellectuals across Western Europe and to a lesser extent in Central Europe and in what later became the United States. And those philosophers shared their ideas via academies, such as, for example, the Royal Society in London, salons, which were essentially debating chambers where people would come together to discuss important issues, both for entertainment and for intellectual stimulation. And it was also the beginning of journals, which we now have become very widespread today. And one of the most important ways that they communicated were handwritten letters that were circulated between the most important thinkers at the time. So everyone had a chance to critique each other's ideas. And I think that's what was, that it was really about. It wasn't so much the ideas. It was about people being able to critique each other. And there was a real discussion for the first time that involved a wide variety of intellectuals in many different domains. So why is this 
this theory plausible? Most economic historians believe that modern progress, as I defined it, started in the Industrial Revolution in Britain, and both England and Scotland played an important role in the Enlightenment. So it's easy to see how that can potentially be perceived as a cause. The Industrial Revolution also was either during the Enlightenment or soon after the Enlightenment. And the Industrial Revolution clearly involved the application of science and reason to solve problems for humanity. And as nations industrialized, the ideas of the Enlightenment became more and more widespread. So I think at first blush, the theory is quite plausible. So let's go into a little more detail about the Enlightenment and who was involved in it. The center of the Enlightenment was in France, particularly Paris, and one of the most important was Voltaire himself. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of details on each one of these. I just want to give you a flavor of what the arguments were from this time. Voltaire was a very important advocate for freedom of speech and for the separation of church and state, and he wrote some very biting satire, which really challenged the Catholic Church and its dogmas. Diderot was also one of the most important. He was the founder and the editor of the Encyclopedia. Think of it as Wikipedia of the 18th century. Essentially what Diderot and his followers were trying to do was capture all knowledge and skills and put it into one gigantic book. And one of the things that was most interesting about Diderot is he wasn't talking just about philosophy. He was also talking about the basic skills of artisans, of how to, for example, print books and how to create engravings. It played a major role in changing people's ideas at that time. Also important was Montesquieu, who was a historian, judge, and philosopher. And he was most well known for advocating for the separation of power. And he played a very important influence on the founding fathers of the United States. And perhaps the climax of the Enlightenment was with Condorcet, who was both a mathematician and philosopher. And note that a lot of these thinkers were very talented in many different fields. Condorcet advocated for constitutional government, public schooling, equal rights, the very idea of progress. In fact, many people think of the modern idea of progress as originating with Condorcet. And he was an early advocate for what you might call classical liberalism. And unfortunately, he paid the price by being killed in the French Revolution. Now, one other thinker was extremely influential during this time, and it's quite controversial whether he was really part of the Enlightenment or whether he was part of what you might call a counter-Enlightenment. And that is Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who was born in Geneva, but he did most of his work in France. And he was, in many ways, the opponent of the Enlightenment, because he, whereas the most Enlightenment thinkers thought of civilization as the highest form of humanity, and they wanted to continue, Jean-Jacques Rousseau believed that civilization had enslaved humanity, made us unequal, and created all the problems that we have today. So we need to go back to our natural state. Many people consider him the forerunner of Romanticism, which came after the Enlightenment and was really, in many ways, a, a revolt against rationalism and in favor of a more romantic view of humanity based on emotions. The other main center of the Enlightenment was in what later became Britain or England and Scotland. And perhaps the most influential of all in thinkers was John Locke. Now, many people consider him to be before the Enlightenment because of his time periods, but his ideas were so influential that it really is hard to understand the Enlightenment without thinking about John Locke. And John Locke also played a very important role in the ideals of the United States Constitution later. He was an early founder of classical li liberalism. He was one of the most important originators of what's called the social contract theory, that human beings are born with certain natural rights, and the state was created by a voluntary contract among the people, and therefore the states have limited authority of what they can and can't do. He also 
believed in empiricism, that knowledge comes not from rational thought, but from observations of the real world. He advocated for natural rights, property rights, constitutional government, and religious tolerance. The thinker of the Enlightenment that was in some ways the most modern was David Hume, who was a philosopher, historian, and economist. Essentially what David Hume did was he took the skepticism of the Enlightenment towards the established order of monarchies and the Catholic Church, and he pushed it even farther to really question how much we actually know from our observations. So he was in many ways a radical skepticist. He believed that passions, not reasons, govern human behavior, and that ethics are based on emotions, not on rationality. And one of the biggest differences within the Enlightenment was the rationalist side, which tended to be in France, where they believed that rationalism was the root of all good and that we must be as rational as possible. And then the Scottish Enlightenment that tended to believe that human beings were driven by passions. Perhaps the most influential thinker of the Enlightenment was a Scotsman named Adam Smith, who I'm sure you've all heard of. He was an economist, and you may not realize it, but he was also a moral philosopher. He talked not only about free market economics and argued against the mercantilism and state interventionism of that time, and a pioneer in what you can call political economy and classical economics, but he also believed that a free market society had to be based on morality. Many thinkers believe that the Enlightenment culminated with Immanuel Kant, who was a philosopher, and he had very complicated uh, philosophies that I, that's just way too much to go into in this videos, but he did make major contributions in the field of philosophy. And he's definitely one of the most important philosophers of all time. Now let's get on to what the actual impact of the enlightenment was. I don't think there's any doubt that the enlightenment made enormous contributions to philosophy, particularly political theory, they form the foundation of many modern ideologies, particularly classical liberalism and liberalism in general. And they focus on gov government and they really helped to change how people thought about religion, science, and they made major contributions to art, music, and literature. In fact, I think it's fair to say that the Enlightenment thinkers helped to define what is unique culturally about Northwestern Europe and the societies that were founded by settlers from that region compared to the rest of the world. But it's not clear that all of the Enlightenment thinking was positive. For example, I think you can make a really strong argument that much of the political instability in France during the 19th century was caused by Enlightenment ideals. The Enlightenment was very good at challenging established institutions, but they weren't so clear about what should replace it with. And so you had, particularly in France, Revolution and coup d'etat after revolution and coup d'etat again and again. Most historians believe the Enlightenment had a very important role on what is probably the single most important revolution in world history, the French Revolution, starting in 1789 and then ending, well, there's debate on when it ended, but I'll call it uh, 1794. That did not establish regimes of what the Enlightenment were calling for. What it did establish was political instability throughout 19th century, including two different coup d'etats by Bonaparte's and revolutions in 1830, 1848, and 1871. And this is not even a comprehensive list of all of the political rebellions that took place in France during that time period. And certainly one of the most important conservative critiques of the Enlightenment is that it leads inevitably to political instability that disrupts daily life. And it's also not at all clear that the Enlightenment helped French material progress. 
France was the heart of the Enlightenment, but during the 19th century, France was a laggard in terms of economic growth in Northwestern Europe. In fact, it was only in 1881 that France reached the per capita GDP of that Netherlands had been in in 1700 before the Industrial Revolution. And during that same time period, many other nations experienced dramatic economic growth far above France. Uh, I apologize for the alignment of these years somehow that's got screwed up in production. Many nations during the 19th century went through tremendous economic growth that we now call the Industrial Revolution, and France fell behind all of them. Is that to bl- are the is the enlightenment to blame? No. But it does start to undermine the idea that it led to human material progress. I believe that the Enlightenment was actually a benefit of progress, that essentially human material progress started much earlier than the Enlightenment, largely in the medieval cities of northern Italy, and then it later moved to Flanders, which is now Belgium, Netherlands, and England. And this was well before the Industrial Revolution. The economic growth in these commercial cities helped to undermine the legitimacy of medieval institutions, whether it's the Catholic Church or monarchies. They created vast amounts of wealth so that people could spend money on more things than survival. Some of that amount went to intellectuals so they could devote more time to thinking thoughts. So... The intellectuals of the Enlightenment was a result of progress. It wasn't a cause of progress. And one of the most interesting outcomes of the Enlightenment is that the kind of thinking that in many ways challenged the establishment became fashionable among elites, the kings and princes. And so they began to sponsor Enlightenment thinkers. And in some cases, they even tried to implement reforms following along the lines of the Enlightenment. So all of this created the material conditions that made the Enlightenment possible. Now, I'm not saying it made it inevitable, but I do believe it made it possible. So the Enlightenment absolutely resulted in philosophical progress. It resulted in scientific progress and it resulted in artistic progress. But did it really benefit the masses? No, I don't think it did. Now, you might say that per capita GDP is not a perfect measurement of progress. No, it's not perfect, but it is the closest that we have if you're looking at material standard of living that benefits a large group. So now, in some ways, this debate is really a part of a bigger debate. Is it ideas that cause us to change the world for better, or is it the material conditions that enable those ideas to come forward in the first place? In some ways, it's a chicken and egg that is not possible to totally resolve. Obviously, ideas matter and material conditions matter, but I have to admit, I am a materialist. I believe that human beings, because we are biological organisms, are seriously constrained by material conditions, both in the natural environment and in our societies. And it's only when a certain amount of progress takes place that then we can come up with ideas to make that progress even better. So I I believe that ideas matter, obviously. Otherwise, I wouldn't be writing books or making videos. Ideas clearly matter. But the heroes of progress are not philosophers and intellectuals. The heroes of progress are entrepreneurs who start new businesses, who come up with new ideas for technologies and new organizations. And it doesn't necessarily have to be in the economic domain. It can also be entrepreneurs of religion and politics, of nonprofit organizations in any material domain. Second are engineers. These are the ones, particularly in the field of economics and technology, who take the ideas of the entrepreneurs and make them real. As far as I'm concerned, they're the real heroes of material progress. And venture capitalists. These are the people who invest money in the entrepreneurs, giving them the capital to implement their ideas so that they can get a fighting chance to survive against other institutions. And finally, the skilled workers who help to make it all possible. 
So I believe that it's the small ideas that matter, not the big ideas. It's not the big ideas of political philosophy. It's the small ideas of a new technology and improvement of an existing technology to make it better, to make it more efficient, to make it more performant, more useful, more reliable, or easier to use. It is about people learning how to build, test, and use those new technologies or how to apply a new technology to existing business processes, or the idea of a new business model, a production improvement to make the product cheaper, or the idea of how to market or sell a product. So ideas do matter to progress, but it's the small ideas that matter, not the big ideas of intellectuals. But I have to say, I do believe the Enlightenment did contribute to progress in one very important way. The Enlightenment created the intellectual justification for one of the five keys to progress. Now, I'm not going to go into much detail in this video about what the five keys to progress. If you want more, go to my video, What Causes Progress. But essentially, I argue that one of the five keys to progress is the decentralization of political, economic, ideological, and religious power so that elites are forced to compete against each other in a nonviolent way, and that the masses get to choose which one of those elites most benefit them and the rest of society. You see this in freedom of speech, in constitutions, in political parties and elections. You see it in markets. You see it in separation of church and state. And in that area, the philosophers and the Enlightenment played a huge role, but they created the intellectual justification of it. Many of these things had already started centuries before in the commercial societies of Northern Italy. And as I said, I'm going to be making a lot more videos exploring different theories about what caused modern progress and assessing how useful they are. I hope you find this video interesting and you'll come back for more. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please don't forget to subscribe and like. It really helps the channel to grow. If you'd like more resources, I'd recommend going to my website from PovertyToProgress.com. With a free email subscription, you get free ebook samples, free audio samples, and you can buy discounted ebooks and audiobooks. If you insist on paying full price, you can get ebooks, paperbacks, and hardcovers at Amazon, or if you're a bookstore or a library, you can get them at Ingram Spark. Audiobooks are available at Amazon. Audible, and iTunes. If you'd like to know more about books related to this content, I'd recommend going to my other website, which is the techratchet.com. It consists of an online library of over 280 book summaries on the topics of technology, history, economic growth, and progress. And now we're getting on to the exciting part, a free book giveaway of my first book, From Poverty to Progress. If you're a regular listener, you already know the rules. If you don't know the rules, please pause this video and read this description. There's a free book giveaway every week. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and I will see you next time.